welcome to what I hope will be a very lively and interesting debate about the key events in the history of mining in Canada. I'm Jane Werniak. My 45 year career as a geologist has included 15 years as editor of Canadian Mining Journal, ending in 2008. The Canadian Mining Journal was born in 1882 under the name Canadian Mining Review. And so it's celebrating 140 year anniversary of continuous publishing, which is really something considering this is just 15 years younger than the age of Canada as a country. Over this time, the Canadian mining industry has been become one of the most respected around the world. The country is home to hundreds, make that thousands of technical innovations that keep the industry strong. But things have changed a lot over that period. Now the industry recognizes more fully the need to protect the environment, respect human rights, help stop, help slow the uh, climate change and uh, practice sustainability. These challenges are being met with ingenuity and ever more effective techniques. CMJ has been proud to share and encourage these ideas with its readers. Because of my background with CMJ, I was asked to write an article about the history of mining in Canada to celebrate the 140th anniversary of the magazine. Instead of an article, I prepared a timeline of the top 50 events that have shaped the mining industry in Canada and it was published in the May issue of the magazine under the title, A Point in Time. My sources included previously published chronologies, articles, and Google. My article was read by people with the Canadian Business History Association. The idea quickly came together of running a podcast as a joint CBHA CMJ event. At this point, I'm going to turn the mic over to Tabitha Fritz, who is a member of the CBHA board and chair of its development committee. Tabitha? I am uh, on the board of the Canadian Business History Association, which is an association that's dedicated to the pursuit of Canadian business history and its role both domestically and in world business history. Our specific aims include encouraging more studies of enterprise by Canadians and in Canada, helping build and maintain well-structured and open business archives, providing those who study business history a forum for discussing their research with those who practice business, encouraging research projects on relevant subjects, and providing funding for such research, and in general, encouraging the study of business history in Canada. Membership in our association is open to individuals, firms, and groups. And now I would like to introduce our first speaker, who is Deborah A. McComb. She's a principal geoscientist at SLR Consulting and has over 35 years experience in exploration project management, feasibility studies, research and reserve estimation, due diligence studies and valuation studies in diverse geological settings. Prior to joining SLR, Mrs. McComb was president of Roscoe Postal Associates and was chief mining consultant for the Ontario Securities Commission. At the OSC, she was responsible for developing and implementing National Instrument 43-101, Standards of Disclosure for Mineral Projects. Deborah McComb is the co-chair of the Canadian Institute of Mining, Metallurgy and Petroleum, Mineral Resource and Mineral Reserve Committee, a past chairperson of the Committee for Mineral Reserves International Reporting Standards, is a past president of the Association of Professional Geoscientists of Ontario, and is a member of the Canadian Securities Administrator's Mining Technical Advisory and Monitoring Committee. In 2012, Deborah McComb received the Distinguished Service Award from the PDAC and was awarded the Robert Elver Mineral Economics Award by the CIN for her efforts as head of Crisco in the coordination of worldwide standards for resource and reserve reporting. Deborah McComb is also the recipient of the 2013 Canadian Professional Geoscientists Award in recognition of her outstanding contribution to the development and practice of professional geosciences. Deborah received the CIM Distinguished Service Medal for Distinguished and Meritorious Service to the CIM and the Mineral Industry and the CIM Selwyn Blaylock Canadian Excellence Award in 2020 and 2022, respectively. Mrs. McComb serves on the Board of Directors for Agnico Eagle Mines. 
Mrs. McComb is the author of numerous articles and presentations prepared to assist mining companies and their legal advisors and mining industry professionals in a better understanding of the Canadian disclosure rules for mineral projects. Mrs. McComb is a lecturer at the Schulich School of Business and Osgoode Hall Law School, York University on Canadian disclosure rules for mineral projects. Deborah McComb has been recognized as a consulting expert in who's who legal mining in 2022. Deborah. Thank you very much, Tabitha. It's, a, um, it's really a pleasure to participate in this podcast on the history of the Canadian mining industry and moderate the panel of four well-known personalities who have contributed to our knowledge of the mining industry. So I'm going to jump right into the session today. And our first panelist is Jane Werniak, who is a professional geoscientist. Jane's an experienced senior geologist and technical writer. As previously mentioned, it's Jane's recent A Point in Time article in the Canadian Mining Journal that inspired today's discussion. So thank you, Jane. Jane completed her undergraduate studies in geology at Queen's University and her master's at Carleton. Her career has taken her from South Africa to Ontario to the Northwest Territories and the Yukon, where she explored for uranium and base metals. Apparently, after an encounter with a bear in the Yukon, Jane embarked on a scientific editing and writing career, starting with the Newfoundland Mines branch, followed by a textbook publisher, and ultimately, as many people in the industry know her, as editor of the Canadian Mining Journal. Jane recently retired from Agnico Eco Mines, where she combined her geological background and technical writing skills. Jane is an enthusiastic member of the WIM Toronto Walking Team, International WIM and Toronto Geological Discussion Group. And today, Jane will be discussing the discovery and development of nickel copper ore in the Sudbury Basin of Ontario. Jane? Thank you. Thanks a lot, Deb. Um, I will uh, hopefully get my slides up here in the right way. Sorry, I can start. Okay, so sorry, that, that was the article, by the way. Um, so it was really hard to choose one key event. Uh, like it was really hard for me to get the this article uh, timeline down to 50 key events in the mining industry and then to get it down to just one was tough, but I'm confident that at the end of my eight minute presentation, I'll convince you that my choice was at least one of the one of the most important events in mining in Canada. The, the, my event is the discovery and development of nickel ore in the Sudbury Basin of, of Ontario. Yes, it really is the center of the mining universe. And here's the basis for my choice. Um, there are long life, uh, large long life mine deposits uh, scattered around the basin. It, it has been actively mined since 1886 uh, with uh, altogether 50 mines. Uh, there's currently two smelters and refineries, and they produce refined nickel, copper, and valuable byproducts. And it's going strong. It shows no signs of slowing down as a mining center. Um, Sudbury is the basis for the start and growth of two major Canadian mining corporations. Uh, it has, over the years, become a mining hub and home to mining equipment, service and consulting firms, many mining research centers, uh, the Mining and Geology Schools at Laurentian, and the Ontario Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources, and Forestry. Um, where is? Where is Sudbury? It's in uh, north, uh, south central Ontario, just north of Georgian Bay, Lake Huron. Uh, and here's a picture of the, uh, the basic geology. I could not go without showing you the geology of the Sudbury Basin. Uh, the red stars are current mines, the gray stars are past producers, and you can see they form a, a ring around the what's called the Sudbury Basin. Mines are associated with the edge of the Sudbury structure, which is a famous geological feature formed 1.85 billion years ago by a catastrophic event, and I don't need to say any more about the geology than that. But you can see it was big, 60 kilometers long, 27 kilometers wide, 
15 kilometers deep. It's been deformed subsequent to the initial formation. Uh, it hosts one of the largest concentrations of nickel co copper sulfides in the world. Um, <clears throat> so, next slide. Um, so here's a timeline of, of the beginnings, the, the discovery. In 1856, the nickel copper uh, iron mineralization was first detected by a couple of people working for the uh, government, and then that was forgotten for a few years. In 1885, uh, a sulfide showing was discovered by the blacksmith uh, Thomas, uh, what's his name? You can see it there. A, a blacksmith working on a CPR main line. They did a rock cut, uh, opened up some new rock. He saw the sulfide mineralization. A few other people came in, scooped it up, staked it, and isn't that the nature of mining? Uh, by 1886, this showing had become part of the Murray deposit that opened as a mine. In 1886, the same year as Copper Cliff, Stobie and Evans mines, 1901. Uh, Victorian Creighton mines opened, and the Creighton is still in operation. Little Stoby mine opened a year later, and in 1929, the Falconbridge mine opened. All of those first mines became part of Inco. The Falconbridge mine became part of Falconbridge. It was a little late to the game. Based on today's metal prices, the 50 historical and current mines have produced an estimated five. 192 billion Canadian dollars worth of metal uh, in nickel, copper, cobalt, platinum group metals, and other byproducts. And so I had to look, how big is this compared with other mining centers in Canada? So I did a calculation, and based on today's metal prices, the historical production of the Kirkland Lake region gold mines came in at 111 billion Canadian dollars. Timmins gold mines at 182 billion Canadian. The uh, Kid Creek base metal and silver mine in Timmins came in at 102 billion, misspelled, sorry. And the Sullivan base uh, metals and silver mine in BC at 63 billion. So, really, economically, Sudbury is the big one historically in Canada. There are eight mines currently operated by three companies in the Sudbury area, and, and that's the names of them. And in, um, in uh, let's see, what have I got? In uh, 2019, there was a total uh, economic contribution of uh, $7.5 billion in gross output from the Sudbury area mines, $3.3 billion in GDP, uh, and over 20,000 full-time equivalent jobs for direct and indirect employment in the Sudbury mines. So it's, it's large by, any, by most standards. What's the impact on the Canadian and global mining? Well, the early success of Sudbury encouraged money to be invested in mines and mineral exploration in Canada. Early days, when I look at the early versions of the Canadian Mining Review, there was a lot of skepticism. How many of these mines were really were real? How much fool's gold was out there? And even the editor of Canadian Mining Journal doubted that Sudbury could be what it was said to be until he went for a visit. And then that was a remarkable uh, editorial where he said, it's all true, it's all true, believe it, put your money in, into this. Um, the initial financing large and, and the metallurgical technology largely came from the United States and Great Britain uh, with the Norwegian uh, refinery in uh, Norway. Um, the, the profits generated out of Sudbury built many mining companies, including the two big ones, Inco, which is now part of Valley, and Falconbridge, which is now part of Glencore. And there's several mining research centers in Sudbury, including uh, MERC, the Merck, and uh, SEMI. And, and these research centers have created research and technology that's been exported to the rest of the world. Um, not all of the impacts of Sudbury mining have been positive. Um, it's funny because for many, many, it's not funny at all. For many, many years, I was visiting Sudbury on when I was at Canadian Mining Journal. I was covering all the stories. I was writing everything. I never heard anything about First Nations, and I didn't think about it. And 
I'm sorry to say, but I guess I assumed, well, I, there weren't any First Nations people living in that area. Well, that's not true. There are, there have been, there always have been. There's, um, so I looked into it more recently, and there's three indigenous communities in the Sudbury area, the Sagamok, yeah, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing this, Atikamekshen, uh, and the Wanabate, and they all, I think, are part of the uh, Anishinaabek group and, and language group. Um, but in, until fairly recently, there was no sharing of resources, there were, and there were no agreements with mining companies and the First Nations in the area until starting in the 1980s and 1990s. There now are long terms agreement in place with the Valley and Glencore and and there are other agreements that are um, are negotiated um, one by one with exploration companies as they come into the area, submit um, applications for exploration permits and plans. Um, I, from what I understand, talking to um, a representative of, of the um, Wanapate First Nation, they're, they're, the three nations in the area are starting to work together, especially in their approach to Valley and Glencore and the long-term agreements. So there's there's improvements. Um, um, the impact on other stakeholders, well, everybody uh, did not benefit, or nobody benefited from the environmental degradation that came to the Sudbury area as a result of, of the mining um, re, uh, mining process and smelting and, and refining. Um, by the mid, uh, initially, um, the ore was smelted on the ground, burned with lumber, and the, the smoke just, just spread on the ground. Then it became a little more sophisticated, so there were smokestacks that took the sulfide, the sulfur uh, dioxide a little bit more distant. But, but um, by, by the mid 70s, there was uh, 175 square meters of land with no vegetation in the Sudbury area and another 700 square, I'm sorry, square kilometers of land with semi-barren terrain because of, because of all the pollution. The regreening of Sudbury began in the 1970s and continues today. It's improving and there is less pollution, but it's still historical legacy. But here is something really good. Um, more recently, the government of Canada has developed a list of 31 minerals that are critical, critical to the uh, um, sustainable economic success of Canada. And the list includes the top four products of the Sudbury area mines, which are nickel, copper, platinum group elements and cobalt. Uh, these, these metals are, are necessary for renewable energy and, and uh, clean technology applications such as batteries, permanent magnets, solar panels, wood, wood, wind turbines, and other advanced manufacturing supply chain requirements. Um, the demand for nickel is especially, is expected to be particularly strong uh, just to meet Canada's decarbon uh, decarbonization objectives. While it used to be just in time delivery, now it's just in case hoarding of the metal. And that is my case for Sudbury. Thanks very much, Jane. Uh, uh, you've partially answered the question that I was uh, about to ask you, and uh, it was uh, about uh, the future of Sudbury and obviously um, it looks like the critical metals will be something that will continue on it just extremely briefly could you just make any comment at the um, PDAC convention last week I sat in a few sessions about critical minerals and um, and uh, well, they were saying that in, in a fairly short order, the world demand for nickel is going to be four times what it is now. At Sudbury doesn't supply all of the world's nickel, but it's still a very good portion of it. And I'm sorry, I don't have the stat on that. And, and I think we all know that, that uh, copper is, uh, while it's waning, you know, waxes and wanes in general, it's on the rise as, as a metal critical to um, 
electrification and um, uh, demand is going to be there. Uh, you've seen the Sudbury structure. It's huge. It hasn't all been mined. Um, you know, their con expiration continues apace. There, um, I, I think the future is going to be better than the past. You know, the, the methods of exploitation and um, the environmental damage will, will be less. Uh, and, and the uh, working in concert with the local community and especially with the local First Nations people, it's happening, it's real. So it's, it's, I think things are going to be better. And it's mineral wise, Sudbury has minerals for, you know, decades and decades still. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, so it's a nice segue into our second panelist, uh, Glenn Nolan. And Glenn has spent over 40 years in the mining industry, mostly in early stage mineral exploration, and more recently as an executive of Wailu Canada, which is developing a nickel copper deposit in the Ring of Fire region of Northern Ontario. Glenn's also served nine years as chief of the Missinabi Cree, his home community, and as former president of the Prospectors and Developers Association of Canada. As a youth growing up in the Missinabi Cree First Nation, Glenn experienced firsthand the positive impact that gold mining had for members of this community. Glenn has learned firsthand the importance of working closely with Indigenous communities that were near the project he was working on. Glenn is considered one of the leading experts in building relations between Indigenous communities and exploration companies in Canada and internationally. He's committed to continuing greater dialogue between communities and the mineral industry. Glenn serves on a number of non-for-profit boards, and today he'll be contrasting Missinabi Cree First Nation participation in mining in the past and present. Uh, thank you, Deb. And uh, I wanna mention that I'm presenting from the Treaty 3 territory near Atacocan, Ontario. Um, this is my adopted homeland, and I've spent uh, much of my adult life uh, raising my family here, and uh, now I, I have the joy of having my grandkids uh, in the area. Anyway, um, I wanted to talk about my community and its evolution uh, in the mining industry and how it has transformed us socially, economically, and um, how it has impacted us as uh, Indigenous people. So before mining was a, was a, a significant contributor to our community, we did a, a variety of jobs, you know, from, from uh, guiding uh, hunters from mostly from the United States or anglers that would come up every summer, uh, or um, you know, having to go out and uh, sustain ourselves from the resources off the land, whether it was fishing from the lakes uh, at various times of the year to uh, hunting moose. And uh, and if we couldn't um, buy, didn't have the money to buy um, the staples like flour, or sh sugar, uh, and other products, oatmeal, uh, we would uh, trade the fish or the moose meat with a, um, a restaurant in Chapo, Ontario. And uh, that provided us with, uh, you know, more variety in our food, but we were still impoverished. So this photo is a picture of my father and one of my older sisters. And um, you can see the condition of the house. That was our, that was our home. And uh, we didn't have power. We didn't have uh, running water. We didn't um, have a road to the, to the house. Uh, we had a trail that went from our, uh, our house to a train station near um, the community of Loch Alish. And uh, basically, we live from season to season and without putting anything away for, for future generations. And But more importantly, I think it never, it wasn't something that uh, inspired uh, uh, the young people, my older brothers and sisters, to think of uh, what they could do different. Because what their world was uh, one of living in a very, very tiny community and existing pretty much hand and mouth. Uh, a gold mine opened in our territory 
I wasn't the first one, but it, it really opened up the opportunities. And the mine manager, uh, this was back in the late 40s, 1949 specifically, uh, the Renabi gold mine opened and he invited uh, some of our adult men to come and work in the, uh, at the mine site. And what it changed for us was it provided a new normal, uh, something that offered our communities financial uh, benefits, but also more of an acceptance within a society that was different from the one that we were used to. And if anyone has made a sub substantial change in their life, whatever it is, uh, this is, you could consider this from, from being a hunter-gatherer to a wage earn earner in an industry that was pretty much unknown in our community. And it's very representative of many of the examples we have today was a commitment for change, uh, taking a risk that uh, no one else in their family, previous families had to do because they, they considered the options they had to be very limited. And so people like my great uncles um, who went to work at the mine first, uh, eventually invited you know, uh, people of my father's age to go and work at the mine. So my father had a grade three education uh, the mine saw something in him and encouraged him to get his uh, grade 10 high school equivalency and, and then go on to get a trade. And when my father left the mining industry at 55 years old, uh, he had uh, three uh, trade tickets. Plus he had the, uh, and I meet people today that worked with him at uh, ver various mines and still remember him and talk with fondness of, uh, you know, what a worker he was. What a, what a person to, to spend time with. And it always brings tears to my eyes when I hear uh, those people reminisce about working with my dad, because what he demonstrated was a willingness to participate in an industry that was unknown to, uh, unknown to him when he was growing up. And what that did for our community and for my older brothers and sisters was transform how we thought of the future. The future of living hand to mouth, uh, hunting, gathering, fishing uh, to feed our families, but living in an impoverished uh, existence. That changed when we started looking at the world in a bigger view. And I remember we took trips that we wouldn't have been able to take. We owned a car uh, we would never have been, owned, uh, been able to own previous to this. Going around, driving around Lake Superior uh, in the 60s was kind of unheard of for our, within our community if you weren't working full time. Uh, this opened up my mind and, uh, to other opportunities. It opened up my eyes and my older brothers and sisters uh, to other opportunities. My five older brothers all ended up with a trade in beginning in mining and uh, taking it somewhere else. Some continued in mining in Sud the Sudbury Basin. Uh, others worked in heavy industry at steel mills in, uh, in Welland, Ontario. And I have one of my brothers was a uh, um, uh, steam fitter in uh, the gas plants out in uh, Alberta. But this is not unique to my family. It's consistent with the families of, in our community. And then the next generation, my generation, and the generation that followed me, the opportunities that seem to open up even more. And uh, I, I stayed in the mining industry because it allowed me to be in the bush. I didn't want to be in the mining sector itself. I didn't want to work in a mine. I tried that when I was in high school as a summer student, but I found the opportunity to be out in a bush where that was where I came alive, uh, doing the mineral exploration, doing the geophysics that I was uh, I was trained to do. That was what I where I found my niche, and it helped me to provide for my family. It helped me to understand this industry that could be something to offer more than just the. Um, just the basic work environment. And to today, um, my community has uh, considerable revenue coming from two impact benefit agreements that we have with, with two mines in our territory. Also, we've expanded to be very um, involved in the forest sector, another area that, you know, is not traditionally known as a as something that First Nations get into, more and more are getting involved um, in having the forest sustainable license uh, and uh, having companies that do the work out on the land. And my community is part owner of a, 
of a sawmill and a um, biomass uh, power generating plant up in Horn Payne. Think of is that our community has has advanced. Uh, we don't we haven't solved all of our social problems, uh, but we, we the biggest problem we have is we can't find enough workers from our community to meet all of our contract obligations when it comes to working in our mines or working in other areas that we have uh, contracts with. And uh, so we reach out to other communities to bring in workers from those communities. But it, what it has also done, it's allowed our communities to, uh, our community members to believe that they can do anything. And so we have people who are engineers. Uh, they, some of them are doctors in, in marine biology. We don't have a sea near us or an ocean near us, but we have a, uh, someone who has a PhD in marine biology. We have lawyers, uh, we have um, business owners, trades people. We still have a lot of people that are working in the mining sector, uh, executives in various um, business uh, opportunities, uh, bankers. So I think the catalyst was the chance that um, my forefathers took to come to work at a mine and take that initial risk of changing who they were as it, the expectation of being a hunter gatherer. The last thing I want to say is that it hasn't changed us who we are as a cultural people, as, as Cree and OG Cree people. We still maintain our, our connection to the land. We still train our our young people to believe in the land and understand the land in the way our ancestors understood it, but we use more modern conveniences to go out on the land. Uh, so I think that that is the transition for most Indigenous communities across the world. If we want to get out of poverty, if we want to deal with issues around uh, domestic violence, if we want to deal with issues around uh, a housing crisis that we have or our health, uh, we're all healthier now because we are able to provide uh, a better uh, lifestyle. So I think I'm, I'm going to end it right there. Miigwech. Lynn, thank you so much for your uh, sharing your experiences uh, with us and your community. Just a very quick question. Um, based on your comments, um, are the Missinabi Crees First Nations experiencing impacting Indigenous groups' participation in mining projects on a global basis as well? Uh, could you say that again? I wasn't quite sure. Sure. So basically what it is, is the, the experiences that, that you have, are, you, are these extending to other Indigenous groups globally? Well, interesting you asked that question because I've done quite a bit of work in Latin America and the communities that invite me to uh, to talk to them about the opportunities are all willing to work in, in the industry. They want it done better. They want the, the environment protected. They want their culture protected, but they want to have the opportunities to either own businesses or have direct employment. And I think that is where we're transitioning into instead of uh, companies coming in and, and uh, just hiring a few workers here and there. Uh, the companies have a cultural change as well that they want to maximize the benefits to these communities. So yes, I am seeing that um, in, in my experience in Latin America specifically. I don't have a lot of experience in Africa, uh, but I can say that we are seeing that here in Canada extensively. And we are uh, I'm seeing that with the groups that I've been invited to uh, work with in uh, countries like uh, Bolivia, Peru, uh, uh, Ecuador. Uh, well, there's a number of them. So okay. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So our third panelist is Jacqueline Allison, who's CFA and a professional geoscientist. And she's going to be discussing the establishment of the first Canadian mining school. And Dr. Allison holds a master of science um, degree in mineral exploration and a PhD in mineral economics from McGill University and is an active participant in the CIM Management and Economic Society. And she's been formerly uh, chair of uh, the Education Committee for over 10 years, I believe it is. She also serves as trustee of the CIM Foundation, is a member of the CIM Council, 
um, also in the Humber College Finance Degree Program Advisory Committee and the PDAC uh, Mentorship Program. Dr. Allison has over 20 years of experience working for major financial institutions and mining companies in fields of financial and analysts, investment management, and investor relations, and currently serves on the board of several private and public companies. Jackie? Thank you very much, uh, Deb, and thanks uh, to all for having me here. I'm really excited to present the case for education in mining. And so while this is uh, the event that's driving this, Canada's first school of mines established in, in 1871, McGill University, this is really about the broader importance of education in mining. So let's have a look through this. Let's see. So, um, you know, this is some information taken from the website, Department of Mining Engineering founded uh, just after Canada became, um, you know, the nation. Um, 1874, metallurgy, which is the study of metals, was introduced to the department. And in 1898, the name was changed to Mining and Metallurgy, recognizing that. And it wasn't until 2007 that the department was renamed again mining and materials engineering which just reflected the expansion from you know just from metals to all materials and so for a century and a half um, our graduates as it says on the website have shaped the face of mining here in Canada and around the world and this is a statement that you know well if you change the time uh, the time frame on it um, could be said of many mining schools and so we're going to go and talk Broadly, I'll give a lot of examples from McGill because uh, that's the event that uh, drives this. But again, a lot of it's in common with other um, universities. So McGill is uh, its department in, of mining and materials engineering is top ranked. It's number one in Canada, number six in the world. Um, and these objectives um, would again be common to many of the um, the universities that produce uh, uh, that have mining programs. So high quality engineers need to be produced to work in the industry, but also related fields. So they go beyond mining as well. Um, of course, they're training grads and postdocs in uh, advanced research and fundamental as well as applied topics. Um, and so not just, um, you know, increasing the body of knowledge, but, uh, you know, very important aspects of um, innovation and, um, and optimization. And so they also promote strong interaction with industry. Of course, we're trying to solve real world problems and foster economic, uh, economically competitive and sustainable supplies. In this case, from the builder mentioning critical and foundational materials. And so very important on the world stage. So let's have a look at a sample of research projects. And of course, there are hundreds of them. Um, this one we start with here is uh, the mechanism of rust formation. That was a, a master's thesis back in 1961. At the time, rusting was costing the uh, Canadian economy 300 million, a big number at the time. Um, so important to study that and understand it. And then you'll see a lot of topics here that have great significance in the mining industry even today. And I've taken one or two from each uh, decade. We've got electro winning of copper back in 74. In 1978, Michel Bilodeau, optimization of delineation investment in mineral exploration. He was uh, eventually my thesis supervisor, one of them. And of course, pace backfill, important. Uh, another important topic in 1988, a PhD thesis. And uh, in 1994, before, um, I completed my PhD on uh, computer gaming for mine development and production uh, decisions. Um, see a couple more here, Tailings Dams, Kyoskiu 1999. In 2000, a uh, student at the master's level developed a tax analysis software. Of course, there's understanding, you know, characterization of steel, lithium ion batteries in 2020. And um, there was a big project still underway, um, which Anometries involved, which is rock fragmentation with explosive free chemical demolition agents. And so this is sponsored by Newmont NRCAN, the Ministry of Economics and Innovation of Quebec, and it involves CANMIT materials. So you can see a number of parties coming together to work on important research topics. So a quick look at what's there today, a number of labs, the Cosmos Stochastic Mine Planning Laboratory and the Mine Design Lab. I'll highlight the second item here, which is the Center for Indigenous Conservation and Development Alternatives, which researches life projects, living well, communities of life and indigenous ontologies, which is the nature of being, customary tenure systems and territorial rights. 
So uh, some involvement, and this is a group that has over 70 um, members and uh, collaborators doing research with indig uh, indigenous peoples across the world. Okay, so just so that you know, I'm not entirely biased towards McGill, I thought I'd throw up an example from across the country at UBC. Um, again, they've got a, a statement here on their website, around the world, wherever mines or mineral prospects are located, UBC alumni are working with mining and exploration companies and government agencies. It, they started, uh, you know, a couple of decades after McGill. So 1915, the department was established there. And we're just going to look at a couple of examples of contributions. Their department head, Frank Forward, in 1948, invented the Sherrick nickel process. Uh, in 1948 to 1950, there was intensive research on the hydrometallurgy of uranium. And um, in 2000, 2006, uh, the Norman B. Keeble Institute of Mining Engineering was established, which really transformed the department. And so some of the current research there includes ultra-efficient renewable and decarbonized mine energy systems. Uh, another project is the recovery of rare earth elements from coal seams and mine tailings. So very interesting, lots of potential. So I did want to highlight this one as the key event in our mining history. It's really the establishment of that my first mining school, the start of formal higher education in mining. Um, of course, this provides support for research and innovation, which is very important for the future, no matter what point it's, it's occurring. Um, they collaborate with industry to solve real world problems. There's the development of expertise that's applied locally and globally. When you think about it, uh, it's not just the technical, but also the economic aspects of mining. And um, there are many foreign students as well as Canadians in the department. When I was there, there were certainly students from almost every continent. And there are benefits um, for Canada, I just highlight a few, and some of them were covered by, um, by Jane earlier as well, and as well as Glenn. Economic development, new infrastructure results uh, from some of these mining projects, jobs, housing, healthcare, education, often in remote underserved areas, increased tax revenues, export earnings, improved quality of life in general. I mean, not to say all of the impacts are positive as was highlighted, but there are many um, aspects of mining that do help to improve life. And of course, it's essential for supporting the energy transition. And so just a couple of numbers in here. Um, Canada, of course, is one of the leading mine countries globally. Over 40% of mine, public mining companies are listed on the TSX and TSXV. In 2020, this is some numbers from the Mining Association of Canada, 7.5 billion of global mining equity raised um, in Canada. Uh, employment, 377,000 direct, 315,000 indirect. Largest private sector employer of indigenous peoples at 16.5 thousand. Um, and in 2020, the, the sector contributed 107 billion or about 5% to nominal GDP and accounted for 21% of domestic exports. I'd also add that mining um, accounts for about 50% of the railways um, freight revenue, so very important customer. Um, McGill is now in good company. Lots of other schools that either offer courses or full programs, and you can see a list of them here from colleges to universities. And for those who go on um, to that professional engineer, uh, become a professional engineer, there is a recognition of the importance of ongoing education. And so here in Ontario, there will be a requirement for ongoing professional development from next year. And just a step even going back, uh, for those who are not at university level, um, you know, there's support from PDAC in, in terms of education about mining the schools. And so um, while not everyone would have gone, who works in Canada would have gone through the, one of the Canadian schools, they've certainly interacted with uh, other Canadians who came out or others who came out of the Canadian schools and as colleagues or as mentors. And so um, we do recognize the importance of education and training as underpinning the successful mining industry. And so I'm going to take credit for everything that's been done that's good. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, Jackie. Uh, um, we seem to have a, a shortage of uh, individuals. Um, we're always looking for more to um, join the mining industry and look at it as a potential career. Uh, just briefly, in your opinion, does the presence of these in-country mining schools impact the number of graduates working in the Canadian mining industry? Well, certainly, they are known to be uh, good quality schools, and there are some um, big schools in Australia as well um, that tend to be higher ranked. But, but certainly, um, it's great that we have a number of these schools and colleges that offer either courses or certificates 
projects or, or degree programs so that we can continue to um, at the, the labor pool in Canada. Some of them do go home if they're from other countries. And there's a lot of movement around and we see it all the time, but um, definitely we need to attract more youngsters to the business and not just youngsters, but non-traditional. Um, we need to have more women. We need to keep women in mining. We've talked about this through NES as well. Um, and so it's really about addressing understanding the issues, addressing them, not just attracting people, but retaining them. And so it, it will, it is something that we're, we're conscious of. And at some point, yes, um, you know, there is that concern that with a lot of uh, folks getting older in the industry, we need to, we definitely need to fill in um, with, with younger folks and, and keep them in the industry. Thank you so much. That's yeah. great. Uh, so uh, we'll move on to our, our, uh, our final panelist today. Uh, Dr. John Sandlos, who's an environmental historian with the Department of History at Memorial University in Newfoundland, whose work, uh, work focuses on Northern Canada, mining, wildlife conservation, and parks and protected areas. Dr. Sandlos received his PhD from the Faculty of Environmental Sciences at York University in Toronto, and since 2009 has been the principal investigator of the abandoned mines in Northern Canada Project. Dr. Sandless's most recent book, prepared in collaboration with Arne Keeling, Mining Country, A History of Canada's Mines and Miners, discusses significant impacts in the presence of mining in every part of Canada. And it details the stories of those who built Canadian mines, people who worked in these mines, the emergence of Toronto and Vancouver as centers of global finance, and it also addresses the effect mining has had on Indigenous communities and their land. Today, Dr. Sandlos will be discussing the advent of mining in the Yellowknife region. Welcome, John. Thank you very much for having me. And uh, as you can see, hopefully from the screen, um, I'm going to be talking about Yellowknife uh, as a center of Canadian mining history, which might seem like an odd choice because if you if you go from east to west in Canada, you could you could come up with all kinds of iconic mining places from Bell Island through Timmins and Kirkland Lake, Roy and Noranda, um, Lethbridge, uh, uh, and and so on. You could you could you could find lots of places that could make the claim to the most important uh, event in mining history. But I chose Yellowknife not only because I've been studying the place for over a decade as a historian. But also, I think, because it carries many important lessons for mining. And, and um, as was pointed out, our new book, Mining uh, Country, which I wrote with Aaron Keeling, does try to explore both sides of the industry, both the positive, incredibly important, foundational and fundamental uh, contributions the industry has made to our way of life and our economy and to jobs and, and development in this country, but also some of the challenges and costs of that development. So this brief talk is going to focus on more the challenge side of it and maybe um, you know some of the lessons we can learn from this place. So um, exploration starts at, at Yellowknife really going back all the way um, to the 1890s during the gold rush, Klondike gold rush era. There was some, some limited exploration around Great Slave Lake. But by 1929, uh, uh, Ted Nagel is already exploring on behalf of Canadian mining giant Consolidated Mining and Smelting Company. And in 1934, uh, the famous Johnny Baker discovers the giant claim for a company called Bear Resources. And just a short while later, the first shaft is sunk at a place called Burr Wash, which is kind of across the bay from where Yellowknife is now. Very small mine and an interesting place to visit. Um, but in 1938, Con Mine kind of seals the deal and brings in the era of large scale gold mining in, in Yellowknife. And it is, uh, as many people will know, under the, uh, the control of consolidated mining and smelting. So it's a, it's a big player in the field. And this advance of gold mining into the area was really important. It introduced a settler community. Uh, as people who live in Yellowknife like to say, the gold was paved with streets. They, their community, a lot of people who live there feel that, and I think they're quite right, that it just wouldn't have existed without the, the gold mining. Um, so there's a lot of pride locally in, in the gold mining heritage um, uh, of, of, and we've written about that in other contexts. 
But there's another side to this, and that is the indigenous community, which, uh, uh, as was pointed out earlier, they are actually participating in mining ventures now, and also the remediation of, of giant mine. But at the time, this was a whole new way of life, new way of relating to land. They weren't consulted about gold mining. And many people remember that prospectors just showed up, they heard blasting, they didn't often know what was going on. They sometimes asked the prospectors to leave. Mm -hmm. And there's a local story that a woman named Liza Crookedhand showed the people, used her knowledge of land where the valuable material was. And all she got out of it was a stovepipe, which is probably a true story, but also symbolic of the way some people feel about mining locally. Giant doesn't get going until 1948. And by 1949, it's roasting its refractory ore uh, locally in a facility, which you can see pictured below. And initially there's no pollution controls on that equipment. So there's from the two mines, Giant and Con, there's 22,000 pounds a day of arsenic trioxide dust, highly toxic coming out of both mines. Um, and in 1951, uh, a Dene, a yellow nice Dene boy dies uh, two years old from drinking contaminated water and other people were sickened in the community, according to the testimony of that community. So the mining company does put a Cottrell electrostatic precipitator on into the roasting facility in 1951. And then later on in 1959 at Bagho, so there's a fairly dramatic reduction in pollution of 440 uh, around, you know, between 400-ish and 600-ish pounds a day of arsenic over the ensuing decades up until the end of the 1970s. That dust is being captured and stored underground. So keep that in mind. That becomes important. The issue becomes a national controversy in the 1970s when actually Indigenous people locally, uh, they sort of team up with the United States steel workers to raise awareness of the fact that the community and workers are being exposed to arsenic still. Um, there's editorials in the Globe and Mail, there's an As It Happens uh, show that, uh, that sort of made a lot of waves and there was a, a large public inquiry um, and I don't have time to get into all the details of that but it's a very very interesting story. Um, the arsenic issue kind of went quiet after that. Um, Royal Oak Mines, a uh, company called Royal Oak took over in the 1990s. And, you know, I just point out the probably the worst strike in the post-war history of mining in Canada took place at Giant as well. That's another part of its history where many people will remember um, nine replacement uh, workers were killed by a striking worker who planted a bomb in the mine. And also, I think it's fair to say that Royal Oak engaged in, in what might be described as poor closure planning. And I don't have time to get all the, into all the details because the uh, archival material is voluminous on that. But um, suffice it to say, there wasn't enough money set aside to deal with all of the environmental issues that came up at Giant. So the mine closes in 2004 uh, after a 55 year operating period. And what's left under the ground is 237,000 tons of arsenic trioxide, which people locally say is enough to kill everybody in the world four times. And I actually did the math on how many times you could divide a, a teaspoon of arsenic into 237,000 tons, and you do indeed get a, you know, close to 40 billion doses out of that. Um, and so this was a huge problem. Royal Oak had gone into insolvency. They essentially... Uh, ceased to exist. And so there was no owner or proprietor at the site and it became a public liability. So in the early 2000s, the federal government, which was the regulator developed the frozen block method to deal with this. Um, and, and the idea was you pr probably many people in the audience and on the panel are familiar with the technology of using passive heat exchange to freeze the arsenic chambers to prevent water from getting in. And then there would have to be water pumping on, and this would be a perpetual care site. There'll be care going on for hundreds, if not thousands of years at this site. There was a controversial environmental assessment that began in, in 2008. And based on engagement with the local community, the government decided to adopt a 100 year time frame. And the hope is at the end of that 100 year time frame, there will be technology to safely remove and process the arsenic into something less toxic. So why, what can we learn from all of this? That's your, that's your sort of six minute history of something that I'm writing a book about. So I couldn't go on for hours about it, but I won't. Um, what can we learn about this? Um, 
again, this is, I think, arguably, um, perhaps inarguably, Canada's worst toxic site. It pre prevents a number of what we call wicked problems um, that will require, as I suggested, care that potentially stretches on beyond what most of us think about as, as a kind of normal time frame for thinking about the future. And if, I, I will admit a few times, I really worry about this. I stay up at night and, uh, and I, I've thought about it a lot over the years that I've been researching about what this means in terms of what message we're sending to future generations about the way, some of the ways we've interacted with the land uh, as a species. Um, and, and we've done a lot of work locally on how to communicate those dangers and the care requirements to future generations. And you can find out about that through our website, toxiclegacies.com and the film Guardians of Eternity, which is free to view online. If you, if you wanna check that out, you can just Google it and, and get that film. I think another, so I, th I think one of the big lessons here is that this, this is kind of a, a monument in a way to um, to the fact that um, you know that 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 this industry, this the gold mining industry in Yellowknife came at an immense environmental cost. I think it was also a regulatory wild west um, in a sense, um, and I think I would put the blame most squarely on the government simply for a failure to regulate. Um, there were no standards for arsenic pollution. There were uh, both either in the mine or outside uh, in the surrounding environment. The industry did enact some voluntary controls, but there are periods of time where it was also very resistant to any kind of regulation. So um, in one sense, the, the, the two entities were, were fulfilling each other's needs. Um, and I also think it's important because it does remind us of some of the colonial contexts of mining, the taking of land and the environmental injustices that have been associated with the industry. And again, I wanna say, I recognize that there's been a lot of change and relationships have evolved over time. But if I was to sum up what I'm trying to communicate here, I would say that giant mine is symbolic of how not to do mining. And I think it's a it's an example that we can always look back to. Um, and and we, um, we can look at other examples, like, you know, I think of places like Raglan and so on, where things are being done in a very different way. Uh, and those are good contrasts to giant mine. But I, for me, as a historian, I think that this, this example um, gives us lots of lessons that we need to continually remind ourselves that, that hopefully lead us to doing mining uh, better and doing it well uh, and with a good relationship to land and people going forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. And I think very much so, I think various speakers have, have touched on uh, things where the industry is taking major strides to um, uh, uh, have uh, lots of different aspects uh, improve um, in relationships um, with communities. And, and also at the time, we didn't know a lot of the things that were happening, but we're taking, uh, we're going into doing things in the future in a, a way that's very great with the environment. I know we're pretty close to the end of their time. I, unfortunately, I think we have to wrap up now. So um, I would like to thank all of our panelists today. Um, this is a really great discussion. It would be uh, nice. I'm going to keep everyone in suspense, though, because I encourage all the audience to um, uh, link in to uh, uh, Jane's uh, The History and the Canadian Mining Journal and, and see all the different events uh, in the uh, history of uh, Canadian mining industry. And uh, you can select your own one that you think is the uh, event that was uh, um, probably the one that. Uh, um, uh, is the most significant. And I also would like to thank National Bank for uh, sponsoring this event. So uh, thank very much to uh, each of you and uh, uh, we'll wrap up this podcast at 301. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome to what I hope will be a very lively and interesting debate 
about the key events in the history of mining in Canada. I'm Jane Warniak. My 45 year career as a geologist has included 15 years as editor of Canadian Mining Journal, ending in 2008. The Canadian Mining Journal was born in 1882 under the name Canadian Mining Review. And so it's celebrating 140 year anniversary of continuous publishing, which is really something considering this is just 15 years younger than the age of Canada as a country. Over this time, the Canadian mining industry has been become one of the most respected around the world. The country is home to hundreds, make that thousands of technical innovations that keep the industry strong. But things have changed a lot over that period. Now the industry recognizes more fully the need to protect the environment, respect human rights, help stop, help slow the uh, climate change, and uh, practice sustainability. These challenges are being met with ingenuity and ever more effective techniques. CMJ has been proud to share and encourage these ideas with its readers. Because of my background with CMJ, I was asked to write an article about the history of mining in Canada to celebrate the 140th anniversary of the magazine. Instead of an article, I prepared a timeline of the top 50 events that have shaped the mining industry in Canada. And it was published in the May issue of the magazine under the title, A Point in Time. Uh, my sources included previously published chronologies, articles, and Google. My article was read by people with the Canadian Business History Association. The idea quickly came together of running a podcast as a joint CBHA CMJ event. At this point, I'm going to turn the mic over to Tabitha Fritz, who is a member of the CBHA board and chair of its development committee. Tabitha, 